Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started as people come back. Um, so I'm Sarah Loso, a PhD candidate at Harvard University, and I will be the moderator for this session. Um, so just a couple of quick reminders. The session will be recorded and then posted on the YouTube channel later um, for you to watch. Um, I would like to thank all the presenters and of course the organizers for setting this up. Each presentation will be 15 minutes and then five minutes for questions. You can put questions into the chat and I can read them aloud or you can raise your hand um, in the like participants window so that we can see who has a question or if it's quiet, you can start speaking up. Um, and just a reminder to always uh, abide by the code of conduct and bear with any technical issues since it is Zoom. So our first speaker today will be, oops, let me get my list up, Joshua Zimt with Recognizing Pulses of Extinction from Clusters of Last Occurrences, a Late Ordovician Case Study. Thank you very much, Sarah. Let me get things queued up here really quickly. All right. The structure of the stratigraphic record is a primary control on patterns of occurrences in the fossil record. And while determining how we can best interpret patterns of last occurrences seems like a first order question, this kind of basic understanding is critical for our interpretation of the drivers and selectivity of an extinction event, such as the late Ordovician mass extinction. Now this project I'll be presenting today is a forward modeling exercise that explores the expression of extinction events in the upper Ordovician stratigraphic record. To understand how we can take a detailed sequence stratigraphic and paleoecological approach to the fossil record to interpret the stratigraphic expression of the late Ordovician mass extinction. Now, before we get into the talk today, I think it's important to explain what I mean when I'm talking about the sequence stratigraphic framework. So the sequence stratigraphic framework or sequence ratigraphy is an approach to the stratigraphic record that divides it into distinct packages based on rates of sea level change and sedimentation. And these packages are called systems tracks. There are four systems tracks that we can think about in terms of glacial interglacial cycles. And we'll walk through each of them on the cross section that you see on the screen here. So on the left side of the screen, we have proximal settings in our schematic basin cross section and three facies, a coastal plain facies, a shallow marine sandstone, and an offshore mudstone as you progressively move into distal environments. Now the first systems track we'll talk about is the high sand systems tract or the HST. And you can think of this as being deposited during a late interglacial period. Then as we transition to an glacial period and glacial eustatic sea level begins to fall, we develop the falling stage systems tract or the FSST in the distal part of the basin. During the late glacial interval, we'll deposit the low stand systems tract or LST. And then as we transition back to an interglacial and we have glacial eustatic sea level rise, we deposit the transgressive systems tract or the TST, which is followed by another high stand systems tract. Now, in addition to the four systems tracks here, I'd like to draw your attention to two other points. The first is, is that throughout each systems tract as sea level is changing, our facies migrate throughout the basin. And the second part is, no matter where you plunk down a stratigraphic column in this basin, you would never capture all four systems tracks. And these two things together have important implications for how we look at patterns of last occurrences in the fossil record. And this is because organisms have preferred environments and in the marine realm, these are largely controlled by water depths. And these water depth controlled environments are recorded in the stratigraphic record as facies. Since sea level change controls the lateral and vertical distribution of facies within a basin, it also changes the distribution of taxa. And this results in last occurrences predictably clustering at certain sequence stratigraphic horizons, including subaerial unconformities, facies shifts, and maximum flooding surfaces. And we can see this in simple simulations of the stratigraphic and fossil records. So on the screen here, we have a simulated stratigraphic column from Holland 1995. In the left plot, we have stratigraphic position on the y-axis and a record of water depth on the x-axis. And you can see some of our systems tracks labeled here. On the right plot, we have the tabulation of last occurrences of simulated tax in the simulation. And what will immediately pop out are these large clusters of last occurrences, which we might be tempted to interpret as a pulsed extinction event. However, we know from the simulation that there's a constant rate of background extinction throughout the simulation. 
And so in fact, the clustering of last occurrences you see at the stratigraphic horizons are a function of rapid changes in water depth and facey shifts. And we refer to these as stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences, as they represent the underlying expression of stratigraphic architecture in the fossil record and not elevated extinction rates. And this becomes particularly important when we think about the context of the late Ordovician mass extinction. So a late Ordovician mass extinction, canonically speaking, occurred roughly 445 million years ago and is expressed as two clusters of last occurrences in the upper Ordovician fossil record. And you can see these clusters either in the spindle diagram in the center of the screen, but I've also highlighted them with these red lines here. The first and larger cluster of last occurrences occurs in the, mid in the late Cadian, and the second and smaller cluster occurs in the mid Hernantian. Now these two clusters of last occurrences are often interpreted as two pulses of extinction that are tightly linked to climate change. On the far right of the plot, we have an iso oxygen isotopic reconstruction of seawater from the late Ordovician from Finnegan all 2011 to, to indicate climate changes. So this first cluster of last occurrences is interpreted as a pulse of extinction associated with global cooling and sea level fall. While the second cluster of last occurrences is interpreted as a pulse of extinction associated with global warming and sea level rise, particularly driven by shoaling and anoxic waters. However, given their sequence stratigraphic context associated with major sea level fall and rise respectively, it could be that the two cluster expression of the late Ordovician mass extinction in this fossil record could be the expression of sequence stratigraphic architecture. And this is particularly important as we see evidence of stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences in Hernanchian sections worldwide. For example, on my study site on Anticosti Island in eastern Canada, we see clusters of last occurrences form across the Ordovician Silurian boundary in tight association with major stratigraphic surfaces. For example, in this Ordovician Silurian boundary section that shows ranges of brachiopod taxa, we see that clusters of last occurrences form an association with facey shifts, indicated by this rapid shift from dark to light blue in this column here as well as clustering below major sequence stratigraphic surfaces, such as unconformities. And considering and accounting for these stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences is important given that there have been recent alternative single pulse, multi-pulse, and prolonged extinction scenarios to explain the patterns of last occurrences in the upper order vision stratigraphic record. Thus, studying the sequence stratigraphic expression of the extinction event will be important for understanding the range of causal models that could produce this pattern in the fossil record. Now, Hahn and Paskowski, 2015, proposed that an analysis of last occurrences definitionally up and down dip within a basin, essentially taking a basin-wide perspective of the fossil record, could be used to differentiate stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences from clusters that genuinely represent elevated extinction rates. And so I was interested in using forward modeling of extinction scenarios as expressed in a hypothetical upper order vision stratigraphic record to see if we could apply this test to correctly identify extinction scenarios. To begin, we started off by generating a stratigraphic record, a siliciclastic passive margin using Setflux 2.1. Setflux 2.1 simulates sedimentation and erosion along a siliciclastic coastline and requires a user input sea level history. To run the model, we use an interpreted sea level history from Anticosti Island, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner of this graph uh, of this diagram here with successive 400,000 year 20 meter sea level cycles throughout our 4.2 million year simulation with the Hernanchian, shaded blue on the sea level plot, marked by two successively larger 800,000 year cycles of sea level drawdown of 50 and 80 meters respectively. Now I want to note that the goal is not to simulate any particular basin, but instead to test methods for interpreting patterns of extinction in a hypothetical stratigraphic record. And what you see here is the result of this 4.2 million years of deposition. This gray box down here represents unerodible bedrock colorful wedge here represents our stratigraphic record with the colors indicating different grain sizes. Now from this basin-wide record we extracted five stratigraphic columns with A being the most proximal and E being the most distal. And I want to draw your attention specifically to column D here which is located in a relatively distal part of the basin as we'll be talking a lot about it today. To produce a sequence stratigraphic framework from our stratigraphic record we took water depths as binned in each column and binned them into six relatively coarse facies. So what we're looking at here is the water depth history from column D with stratigraphic position on the y-axis and water depth on the x-axis. The Hernanchian is once again shaded in blue. 
So we took these water depths and we bend them into six coarse spaces represented in this column by different shades of blue with darker shades indicating deeper water and lighter shades indicating shallower water. We then used the facies stacking as well as major stratigraphic surfaces such as this unconfor unconformity here to delineate systems tracks across our two sea level cycles. And to explain the nomenclature here, I just want to note that TSD2 would be the second trans this, the transgressive system tract of the second sea level cycle. We also have 200,000 year buffer intervals of pre and post to account for edge effects in the simulation. To simulate a fossil record, we begin with a taxa pool of 200 taxa, where upon its origination, each taxon has its own unique fixed water depth preferences. We then used a random branching model of origination extinction with the background extinction rate of 0.25 species per lineage per million years to, pop to create a taxa pool for a 4.2 million year simulation. We then modeled a variety of Hernanchian extinction scenarios that are normalized to 80% extinction and simulated a range of single pulse, double pulse, and gradual extinction scenarios across a, a, a several times over. Now let's look at a pattern of last occurrences as expressed in column D from one of our extinction scenarios. So what we're looking at here is stratigraphic position on the y-axis in column D. And now on the x-axis, we have taxa ordered by last occurrence. Each point indicates a column occurrence for a given taxon, while the dark filled in dots indicate where a last occurrence in column D is a basin wide last occurrence across all five of our stratigraphic columns. Now, looking at this column, you might see oh, we have multiple clusters of last occurrences. This might be a double pulse or even multi pulse extinction. However, we know from the simulation that we ran that there's only a single pulse of extinction in this column associated with these stratigraphic horizons. And this underlies an important point, namely that across all of our stratigraphic columns, not a single one across all our extinction scenarios consistently and accurately represented the underlying extinction pattern. So individual stratigraphic columns do not seem to record to reflect the underlying pattern of extinction, but what does it look like in a basin wide record. So for this extinction scenario, which is a second transgressive systems tract single pulse extinction, we took the stratigraphic record from all of our columns and coarsen them to the systems tract level. So now on the x-axis, we have time as been by systems tract, and on the x-axis, we have taxa ordered by last occurrence. We have a variety of different colored bars in this plot, so we're going to walk through each of them in this turn. The blue bars indicate where a taxon is recovered across our basin-wide stratigraphic record in a given systems tract. The gray bars indicate a systems tract where a taxon is absent. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but I'm going to note that we used the facies that we developed and the taxon's occurrence across all the facies in all stratigraphic columns to determine their preferred facies. If a taxon is absent from a systems tract, along with its preferred facies, we indicate that with a dark gray bar. If, however, the taxon is absent, but its preferred facies is present, we indicate that with a light gray bar. In this diagram, we've also included black circles to indicate the systems tract where a taxon goes extinct. And we'll see that for a second transgressive systems tract extinction, we actually recover four clusters of last occurrences on a basin-wide scale. So a basin-wide perspective of a mass extinction scenario as proposed by Hahn and Pascalski does not seem to account for stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences. And we have to ask why this might be. So now we're once again looking at that pattern of last occurrences from column D, but we've added in a column representing facies and the systems tracks. And we see that these two basin clusters, these two basin-wide clusters of last occurrences are associated with facies shifts and major stratigraphic surfaces. Now we know from the simulation that these taxa all go extinct during the second transgressive system tract extinction. These are victims of the extinction event. However, their preferred facies are absent from the available subsequent stratigraphic record in the systems tract between the first high stand and within and including the second transgressive systems tract. Thus, their last basin-wide last occurrence falls in the first high stand systems tract, and a basin-wide perspective would not be able to correct for this backscattering. Thus, we propose a method for removing what we term ambiguous last occurrences that states if a taxon's basin-wide last occurrence occurs at a major stratigraphic surface, and its last occurrence also occurs with a loss of its preferred facies at the systems tract level, then we remove the taxon from our analysis. To better illustrate what I mean when I'm talking about an ambiguous last occurrence, let's look at the basin-wide plot of fossil occurrences again. We see that a taxon in the first high-stand systems tract that has a last occurrence here is 
their preferred facies is absent from the subsequent available stratigraphic record up to and including a second transgressive systems tract. Therefore, their last occurrence is uninformative with respect to the underlying pattern of the extinction. If we apply this filtering method to our fossil record, what we see is that now we have a single pulse of extinction associated with the second transgressive systems tract. And the method has removed and reduced the underlying stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences. Now I wanna note that while we don't have time today, we've run this um, method on a variety of single pulse, double pulse, and prolonged extinction scenarios. And we found that this method removes and reduces stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences across a range of extinction scenarios in a basin-wide analysis at the systems tract level. It provides a consistent and accurate way to identify extinction scenarios, especially when compared to individual columns and a basic basin-wide analysis. However, it does provide, require a well-preserved fossil and stratigraphic record. And fortunately, we have this for the Hernanchen, or sorry, I should say the late order division, such as on my study site at Anticosti Island, where we have a fossil of a stratigraphic record preserved across a proximal distal transect of the basin that has been already correlated in a sequence stratigraphic framework by De Roche et al. 2010. And so my goal for next summer is to return to Anticosti to conduct high resolution sampling of stratigraphic columns across the basin, correlate these columns within a sequence stratigraphic framework to determine basin-wide last occurrences, and remove ambiguous last occurrences to determine the most likely pattern, timing, and tempo, and hopefully drivers of the late Ordovician mass extinction on Anticosti Island. Thank you. Thank you, that's a great talk. Um, do we have, so I mean, you can go through the acknowledgements quickly. We have like two minutes. Are there any questions? Should I stop sharing so I can see the chat? Yes. Well, um, I think you can see the chat if you are sharing still. Oh, I can. Here we go. Yeah, it like pops up, um, blocks some of the screen though. I'm but any still questions? new to Zoom. So Josh, um, were you planning to go to Anacosti in summer 2020 and had to delay till 21? Or were yes. you able to do what you wanted to for your project this year? No, so I did a pre preliminary analysis last summer um, and that was primarily reconnaissance. So we have good data from two stratigraphic sections, but as I was out there with Andre, we're talking about trying to revise some of the sequence stratigraphic framework because the lithostratigraphy is really inconsistent and so based on biostratigraphic and geochemical signatures, you can actually see, and also sequence stratigraphic, you can see that um, the current framework needs to be expanded at a higher resolution, particularly in the eastern part of the island where you have really rapid facing shifts. So I was not, we only have a really preliminary data set at this point. Um, so well, good luck next year. Thank you, fingers crossed. Yeah. Josh, uh, I have a question. Um, so, I, I don't know that well how these how this sequence stratigraphic models work. Um, what uh, how uh, how well constrained do you think the model output is, and or what do you think is needed to improve it, if if anything that's um, that can be achieved? Yeah, so Cephalox itself is quite remarkable. So we're able to run the modules that make up the stratigraphic record in a hundred year intervals. The thing that's missing quite conspicuously is a carbonate module. Um, so we can only simulate siliciclastics, which is why we really, besides other things, we can't even begin to approach the complexity of a record such as Anticosti Island. And so one of the limitations is that we can't simulate any sort of carbonate stratigraphy using this model. Thanks, Josh, great job. Thanks, Chris. Uh, may I give a short and simple question? <laughs> um, I would recommend contacting him since we should move on to stay on ah, schedule. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. But our next speaker is Cole Edwards with oxygen isotope trends measured from Conodon Apatite using secondary ion mass spectronomy, spectronomy um, implications for paleothermometry studies. All right, can you see that screen or is it all red? <laughs> it's all red and it's like presenter mode. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing on this computer. If you go to swap displays, maybe. Oh, you are. There mad. we go. 
Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you much. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today's talk, I'm going to talk about some work I did um, during my postdoc uh, with Dave Fike and Clive, Clive Jones uh, at, uh, at WashU in St. Louis. Um, if you went to the IGCP talk in 2018, you probably saw a similar version of this. Uh, I finally found time. <laughs> and we've done some new work uh, to uh, come up with a story or at least something that I think can um, explain uh, what's going on during the Ordovician leading up to the Gobi. And specifically, we were um, interested in testing um, how can we use conodont um, appetite for oxygen isotopes uh, to you know, address this very famous figure um, by Julie Trotter and her uh, science paper in 2008. Right? So we've seen, I don't know, probably a thousand versions of this. Uh, and really, this paper gets um, a lot of uh, publicity and uh, is important in changing our, our perception or idea of what the Gobi is, how it was caused. And, and essentially, we see this um, kind of linear decrease in temperatures. I guess I forgot to clip, I clipped those temperatures off. But basically, we have this long-term cooling. And only by the time we get to the about Darwinian do we see this kind of uh, emergence into modern sea surface temperatures, and that is co uh, coincident with uh, some of the major pulses of biodiversity uh, that, that represent the, the Gobi, right? And so it, um, I guess one of the, the important points of this paper is that, you know, we've reached this kind of thermal regime where now temperatures and environments are, are more suitable for, for invertebrate life as well as diversification. Um, and so since then, people have done more work on this. Uh, here's the same kind of curve, or at least this is a plot uh, from Paige Quinton and her, her work, um, where, uh, again, trying to recreate the Trotter curve. Um, this is from a section, uh, I don't actually remember, a canning basin, I believe, uh, in Australia. I could be wrong. But uh, what, we, what we see here is that there's an offset. There's a difference in terms of the isotopic values, uh, but they do show an overall uh, increase in values, which uh, translates to a cooling over time. So, so maybe what's going on is there, um, you know, do we have some bias in terms of one section only, which is what uh, Paige's section was, or uh, plot was, where it's just Australia. I have shown in red, these are the data from the Trotter paper, um, where they, those samples were from uh, Australia as well, but again with Trotter at all, that was a global compilation of data that was, I guess, designed to more generally represent what's going on throughout the, the Ordovician and into the Silurian. So, so maybe there's a bias in terms of basins, um, but what I'm going to kind of emphasize today is that there might be also a bias uh, artifact in terms of what's going on with the kind of method you use. So with the Trotter paper, um, this is SIMS based, so secondary ion mass spectrometry. Um, she used a shrimp, one of these devices where you can have very precise spot analyses of your um, sample, and it can generate uh, isotopic values uh, from that. Where, whereas with the, the TCEA approach, right, this is um, the traditional uh, method where these conodonts are, you know, kind of bin, you take a whole bunch of them, you digest them in some acids, separate the phosphate, and combine that with silver, and then run that through uh, a TCEA device. And so what you're doing there is you're purifying that phosphate as opposed to just zap zapping the uh, conodon appetite. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, so just a little background here, you know, these conodons have been used quite a lot in the last decade or so uh, in terms of trying to reconstruct paleo temperatures we see people uh, finding evidence of cooling going on. There are periods of warming. Um, sometimes we see no change, right? So, so here's a, a figure from uh, Bugish et al. where they see increase in values in terms of the conodonts. And so this correlates to a, a slight cooling time period. You see there's quite a lot of variability, um, you know, several per mil sometimes between closely spaced samples. Uh, looking at Paige Quinton's um, paper from PaleoCube, um, she broke it down into individual species, um, and she found that, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> I don't know about you, but it seems pretty noisy, but pretty much consistent, right? So maybe there isn't as much cooling uh, throughout this Geiss interval um, 
as one would expect. And so these um, approaches are, you know, at, at least uh, muddying the water a bit to me as to whether or not, um, or at least when I read them, as to whether or not we can use condonance to, to generate temperature trends, right? So um, the point is, is that they can produce quite a bit of variability up to about two per mil between oh, replicates or um, regularly spaced intervals of sampling. So this, this idea of using appetite as a temperature proxy goes back to the work in the 70s by Longanelli and Nutti, uh, where they would look at essentially bioappetite, right? So it's um, fish, fish bones, teeth scales, whatever appetite forms they could find. And they, um, we can kind of construct uh, in a relationship, uh, an empirical relationship where you can estimate the temperature um, of an environment if you were only to know the isotopic value of the oxygen of the phosphate and that of the water in which the organism lived, right? So this is kind of a, a linear regression showing how um, kind of modern environments and bioappetite preserved there uh, translates to the temperature where you can directly measure that. And so the idea is that you can now uh, recreate temperatures if you know the phosphate. And for our purposes or a lot of these works, um, we assume a seawater value of about minus one in ice free environment. Um, so I just want to point out that, um, so this is great. It looks like all you have to do is just plug in your, your, your isotopic value and you can get temperature. But, you know, if there's that variability, if there's a one or two per mil variability, um, you know, one per mil of change directly, um, that, that's about a four per mil or four degree temperature change, right? And there's been some analyses or reanalyses of these um, data sets. And they see that the, the range, I guess the, the two sigma, error bar is something like, you know, plus or minus nine and a half degrees Celsius. So there's, there's quite a lot of uncertainty in terms of, can I get an a actual temperature um, using this method alone uh, to reconstruct ancient environments? So, so that's with bioappetite, but uh, for better or worse, conodonts are more complex, right? So this is, you know, um, or appetite. This is uh, the classic equation of what uh, makes up a conodon. And what I want to point out is that, you know, what we're targeting, or at least what we're hoping to get is the phosphate bond, because that's the strongest bond. It's going to be most likely to equilibrate with seawater and thus capture the temperature relationship. Um, but unfortunately, there are these other oxygen sources in uh, the conodon appetite. And so people have worked a lot to, to try and quantify, like, how much and where are these sources uh, in the different tissues, which I'll describe shortly. Um, so one way to get around that is to just isolate the phosphate, just make it pure, and, and that's what this TCEA approach and the acid um, phos or the silver phosphate uh, conversion, right? And so by doing that, it's pure phosphate, and you're absolutely sure that what you're measuring is just the phosphate oxygen bond um, that would have presumably formed during uh, an equilibrium. The disadvantage, though, is that this requires a lot of material, right? So this requires tens. Uh, dozens of conodonts to do this. And so by, by combining all these conodonts, sometimes, you know, depends on how productive your bed is, um, you're, you're essentially making a bulk value or a time average value to some degree um, of all those conodonts. And so maybe, you know, maybe that contributes to some of the variability. Um, yeah, it's something to, to consider. So the traditional method, right, you would need all these conodonts and more. Uh, but with a with the sims, right? You only need one or maybe a couple conodonts to to look at and take a a, a mean or a combined value uh, for each element to to generate an isotopic value, and then maybe you can translate that into temperature. So for this study, we we looked at uh, just a couple sections. We really wanted to get sections that had uh, not only very high resolution conodonts throughout its collected interval. Um, but also uh, to kind of minimize the effect of, you know, global compilation. We want to look at a, a single section where we know the environmental conditions pretty well and they're not that much, there's not that much change there. Um, so we have these four sections. Um, they're all pretty much shallow subtitle. So that's kind of eliminating some of the variability of, of combining sections. Um, and we can also look at differences in terms of the, the alteration, right? So the CAI value. We are basically treating uh, the Antelope Range, our Buckle Mountains in Oklahoma, and then the Cincinnati Arch as being um, low alterations, so a CI value of one or two, and then high values are going to be at Shingle Pass 
where it's three and four. Um, so uh, just a little bit about the methods here. Uh, this is for the Sims crowd out there, but essentially what we do is um, we put our, our puck uh, in the device here. We bombard it with a cesium beam. Uh, it blasts it around. It shoots all those beams down through the mass spec, and then it's collected uh, over here. Um, but essentially what I want to point out is that we kind of take a, a standard. Uh, so this is our blue appetite. It was our house standard. Uh, put that in the middle, and then you can see my little conodons are arranged on a piece of sticky tape. Um, you take that, you fill it with some epoxy, polish it down um, to make the analysis um, good, I guess, in the sims. Uh, and so we can kind of measure a conodon, measure two conodons, measure the standard, measure another conodon standard. And so we can kind of very precisely, I guess, um, uh, measure oxygen nystopic values uh, during this um, process. So you can see our error bars um, pretty comparable to what the, the other method is um, using the silver phosphate. So then a little bit about the tissues. I mentioned that there's um, thoughts, uh, apologies, I couldn't get in the lab <laughs> to take a better picture of these continents. So, so this is our uh, crude clipping here. But uh, essentially there are different tissue types that have varying amounts of say carbonate. Um, it's thought that the basal body material um, and that would have the most carbonate, so we definitely avoided that. Um, then there's debate as to whether or not the albin material is best preserved or not, if it has carbonate or not. So for, for our purposes in this study, we just said, let's just take the hyaline crown material and, and let's just, if it's got it, it's got it, but at least we're minimizing whether we're looking at different tissue types to uh, explain any kind of variability uh, that we might see. So what we find is that when we look at um, these different conodons, you can see that uh, all these little craters uh, are the analyses that are done. I tried to color code them to, to show what the isotopic value is of that one spot. And we see that within a conodont, there's quite uh, a lot of variability, but due to the power of statistics, we can sample it a lot more uh, and reduce the uncertainty um, and, and find uh, what we're gonna re represent as a, a mean uh, delta 18 value. Um, we can see that there are some peculiarities sometimes. Uh, so you can see these histograms that show uh, those values. And broadly, they're, they have a normal like distribution, which we would expect um, if it was not uh, an artifact of the instrument. Uh, but we see that there are sometimes some, some weirdness going on with respect to whether we look at the, you know, the top side uh, of this element versus the bottom. You can see that those values kind of break out differently, left and right. This is still something we're kind of exploring, but it could simply be the orientation of where that puck is uh, relative to the, the incident beam. Um, but the point is, is that most of our data uh, come back with, with more or less a normal distribution. Uh, so that's with uh, variability of a single element. If you look at multiple elements of the same species, we see quite a lot of variation. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all these numbers, but you can see that with some of these species, we found uh, quite a few of them and, and analyzed them from the same bed. And we see that actually there's quite a lot of range, um, this last column here, in terms of what is the mean oxygen value of those different elements from the same bed. And uh, you know, my assumption would be like if they're all living in the same water column, you know, why wouldn't they have essentially the same temperature? And we see that you know, some of these are pretty good, like uh, Icotus deltatus is, you know, 0.3 per mil difference between the three species we got. So that's like, all right, great, that works. But then, you know, like Oevicus communis, you know, two, four per mil, two per mil change. So, so maybe there's something going on with that species. And there's a paleoecology uh, question in there too. Um, so nevertheless, we see that the average range of when we look at these different um, replicates of species is comparable to the the range of values that other studies have, have shown. And if we translate that to temperature, you know, that's about a seven degree difference. Um, so quite a lot. Uh, and we see that, you know, oxygen values of surface waters change on a yearly, monthly basis, right? So this is just a simple animation that shows um, how isotopic values are, you know, dancing around, you know, several per mil at any given location. Uh, in marine environments, right? So I guess the point is, is that we probably should expect some variability of, of conodonts 
whether it's um, during the lifetime of an organism, and that explains the variability of a single element, or maybe there's you know migration or um, you know movement of these commonants in different water bodies to explain some of that. So if we show the data here, uh, I'm going to kind of build this figure. So this is um, here are the Trotter data. Um, we have uh, Albanese in 2019 published a much more resolu high resolution um, plot here. Uh, where they have CI values between one to four. And this is, com uh, a couple sections are combined here, uh, unlike the global compilation. Oops, that didn't align right. Um, here's the data from uh, Quentin et al. from the Kentucky sections. Um, and so that was just focusing in on the, the Lake Cadian up here. Uh, and then if we look at ours, we are gonna present our data as box and whisker plots because uh, and looking at the methods, it looks like, you know, a single data point here from, say, the Trotter study represents a median value from a few different elements. And so what we want to show is that actually this variation um, is, is kind of common, uh, or at least expected. And so that's what's represented by these box and whisker plots. These data here are, are just a couple single um, elements that so we couldn't get replicates. And as I build this more, we see the Arbuckle Mountains come in here. Uh, antelope range shows uh, some overlap as well, maybe a slight cooling. And then what I want to focus on now is, um, so we took some of the samples that Paige didn't run uh, from the Cincinnati Arch section and ran them with the SIMS. And we find something very interesting in that the SIMS data are almost always more positive, right? About 1.7 per mil difference. Um, Trotter et al. in 2015 reported that they found there was about a one per mil difference in these uh, values. And so we, for purposes of this paper, we're gonna correct all the SIMS data by a minus one per mil, uh, assuming that the TCEA approach, right, the approach that um, is shown in the white here are more representative of the pure phosphate and that these more positive values are probably representing an admixture of carbonate or hydroxide as well. So when we look at it all together, we do confirm that there is this cooling trend um, throughout the early to middle part of the Ordovician. The temperatures or values kind of stabilize through here. Maybe there's a late cooling uh, stage going on. Um, and then the question is though, what are the actual temperatures? And so I'll conclude by, by showing again, here's the Trotter curve, I kind of flipped the temperature range. Um, and so this is, uh, if I take the kind of smooth line of the data from our study, you know, we have a pretty good overlap uh, between what Trotter found um, in our sections. Of course, there's some variability, but you know, maybe that reflects local basin um, behavior. But I said there's, there's got to be a correction applied. And so as we correct our data by one per mil, um, it actually pushes the temperatures to be even more, to be warmer. Um, and it looks like you know, the, these temperatures are perhaps even warmer than what Trotter predicted in that 2008 study. And so, so maybe it's not even, you know, until the late Dar or late Ordovician do we actually get into uh, temperatures that are consistent with modern values. Um, so I'll just quickly conclude and, and say that, yeah, this is great. You can use the SIMS. Um, you don't need as much commonance to do this. And it doesn't look like the CAI value is a, a factor. Kind of forgot to say that, but uh, we see nice overlap between the high and low alteration values. Um, you know, if you increase the spot analysis count on an element, you can decrease the uncertainty, um, which makes it close to the standards error. And then lastly, um, you know, this increase throughout the Ordovician does seem to be consistent with cooling. Um, but unless you could apply that correction factor, and maybe it's more than one per mil, um, it, it kind of suggests that the earliest Ordovician may have been even warmer um, than we once thought. Okay, I think that's my talk in time. So. Maybe if there's some questions, I can field one or two. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, we actually don't have time for no? questions. Okay. So. Throw me something no in the questions. chat. No questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. If there is I might have to run here and go teach class. <laughs> okay. And then, so thank you again for that. Our next speaker is Richard Robinet with examining the climate tectonic implications of the Sanbian, Cadian environmental chains of the Southern Appalachians, utilizing K-bentonite appetite phenocrysts geochemical correlations. And 
do I see uh, Richard? There we go. Okay. So, um, first, good afternoon. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to be talking about um, the climate and tectonic implications of late Sandy and early Cadian environmental change in the Southern Appalachians. Um, so uh, the co-authors on this work are uh, John Haynes and Stephen Leslie from James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and Ockham Herman uh, from Louisiana State University of Baton Rouge. So um, we see several large scale environmental changes that take place in the latest Sandy and early Cadian in rocks um, in the Southern Appalachians, which is part of the southeastern margin of Laurentia. Um, these changes include uh, the M4 and 5 sequence boundary, uh, which is the fifth third order uh, Mohawkian age depositional sequence um, for the North Ameri Eastern North American Mid-Continent. So across the boundary, we see several changes in the environment. So we see a change from uh, muddy matrix supported uh, warm water or tropical type carbonates to more skeletally supported uh, cool water or temperate type carbonate. Um, you see a change in phosphate deposition, a change in the influx of terrigenous material, the first appearance of the conodont plectodine continuous, and also you see the initiation of the geis. So the Geis is the Gutenberg isotopic carbon excursion, uh, which is a globally recognized uh, positive carbon isotope excursion. Uh, takes place across that Sandy and Cadian boundary. So um, you have different um, interpretations of these changes. So here in the figure on the left, we see a generalized uh, carbon isotope curve for the late order vision. Um, several in interpretations suggest that the geist is just part of a larger uh, isotopic carbon trend, and the geist represents a cooling step that's just leading up to the end order vision glaciation or the Hernantian glaciation. Uh, the figure on the right is just a generalized um, representation of the southeastern margin of uh, Laurentia. And at this time, you also have the, the conchorogeny going on off the southeastern margin, and you have a collision of the southeastern margin with the series of microcontinents or island arc chains. So several uh, um, tectonic models have been proposed to explain these changes also. So the problem is there's no real consensus on whether this is climate-driven usage or if the major dri uh, driving force behind these changes is tectonics. So in this study, uh, try to better understand the relative importance of the tectonic versus uh, uh, climate drivers um, for uh, causes of these envir uh, environmental changes. What we wanted to do is correlate between four widely spaced sections across the Southern Appalachians uh, with enough resolution to be able to distinguish between these differing interpretations. Um, so we wanted to test the timing and synchronicity of these events. And we did that relative to Cape Bent Night stratigraphy. So uh, in the late order vision, you have a series of um, ash ball layers that were deposited. Uh, the Millbrig and Dyke are two of the most extensive and widespread, representing two of the largest eruptions of late order vision. So we wanted to establish this uh, framework of Cape Bentonites so we could test the timing and synchronicity of these events in time and space. Um, so what we're doing is extending uh, the approach of previous work uh, by Cell, who did this in the um, central and northern Appalachians, where he used appetite geochemistry to correlate these Cape Bentonite beds. Um, so what we did is establish tie points for the Dyke and Millbrig across the Southern Appalachians. Um, we wanted to confirm previous correlations that were based on lithology, mineralogy, 
and stratigraphic context of these cave bentonites, but we also wanted to establish new correlations for the Dyke and Milgrig and also for lesser known, less extensive or widespread bentonites. So figure A is just a, a general uh, representation of uh, the paleogeography, global paleogeography at the time, and B represents um, our study area here with the present day political boundaries. So uh, the circle, red circles represent the sections we actually studied and in the black circles these are reference samples that we also used in our study to compare results to uh, uh, samples where the Dyke and Milbrig had already been identified. So the methods we used, um, so we just disaggregated these bentonites in water um, density separated them and then took that heavier fraction and picked it under a microscope with a fine bristle brush. We picked out the apatite crystals and then mounted them in epoxy. Um, we analyzed those apatites by laser ablation, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. So uh, what happens is here's the setup that we used. And basically, you put the sample in this chamber here. Um, the mineral services are targeted by a laser that ablated material is carried by helium gas to an argon torch where it's ionized, and then uh, intensities are measured by a mass spectrometer. So we use an external calibration standard called NIST 612, which is. Um, a homogeneous sil uh, silicate glass for external calibration. And then we used some in-house appetite standards to monitor instrument precision during analysis. Oops, sorry about that. Data reduction uh, was done using um, an iLife version 2.5 application extension for Igor Pro software. Uh, and we used calcium 43 as the external, uh, external element standard. So the results we got for these King Bitten Nights. Um, so we represent the, uh, displayed the data in several different, with several different combinations of elements. Um, and you see the first graph is uh, magnesium versus manganese. And uh, the black, uh, samples in black represent um, the signature we get from uh, Millbrig beds, while the red uh, represents what we see in Bakke beds. And here at the bottom, these are uh, analyses of lesser known bentonites that we also announced, uh, analyzed. And here, based on uh, both of these representations of the data, you get a pretty clear, you can pretty clearly discriminate between each bed. Um, again, here is just another way to represent the data. Um, again, we see the black is Millbrig, red is dikey samples or potential dikey samples. Um, and at the bottom here are lesser known K bentonites. Uh, here on the right, uh, this is a comparison to uh, some cell data where we, we have uh, pretty similar uh, um, chemistry in the dikey. And these red um, diamonds here at the bottom, that is a, a sample that we thought was a dikey, but uh, we're able to exclude as a dikey sample due to its where it groups outside what we should see for the dikey on uh, versus uh, manganese versus uh, lanthanum versus terbium. So here is just uh, um, the strat columns for all four of the, these sections that we studied. And if you look at the placement uh, or the stratigraphic placement of um, each of these events, the guys, uh, Conan astrotigraphy, um, changes in lithology, the M4, M5 sequence boundary. At each session, generally, um, the timing and placement of these are, are generally uh, the same, which it suggests all these events are related. Um, the only difference here is that the start of the guys takes place well below the M4 and 5 sequence boundary at the Fort Payne, Alabama section, whereas at the other sections, they're all pretty much uh, 
coeval. Um, if you look at these events relative to the K bent night stratigraphy that we uh, have developed here, you see that at Fort Payne and Hagen, these events take place uh, post deposition of the Millbrook K bentonite, but at the Gladeville and Arcala sections, uh, these events take place prior to uh, deposition of the Millbrook. So, what we were able to conclude from this is that uh, these events are not always synchronous across the, um, the southern Appalachians, which suggests that one, possibly this isn't driven by um, climate driven eustacy um, and is more likely either driven by local tectonic influences or that that the tectonic influences are overriding whatever you static signal that you see in these rocks. So um, it's going to take more, uh, plugging in more sections across the Southern Appalachians to get a better idea, but that's what our data here tells us. Um, that's all I have for now. Okay, great. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question, Richard. Um, so uh, the taconic orogeny from looking at ages of, I think, metamorphic crystallization, but also, I think, zircons, um, we understand pretty well that it's diachronous uh, along the southern margin where it's younger in the northern Appalachians, or is it younger in the southern? Uh, one, one or the other. Well, it, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm wondering how your uh, so this this depositional model across these four sites does that agree with what's been interpreted from the metamorphic dating? Um, you're talking about the metamorphic dating in the northern Appalachians. Yeah, I guess it's I guess it's mostly been done in the northern Appalachians, but there's whatever whatever kind of dating has been done in the southern as much as it has been done. Um, I'm not sure about the metamorphic dating. Um, as far as zircon dating for these same beds uh, in the southern Appalachians, uh, I'd say it matches up, but I'm not sure about uh, dating in the northern Appalachians. Cool. Thank you. I do know the the Taconogorazmi is, is is younger in the say the southeastern margin of Laurentia, which would be the southern Appalachians, and it progressed up through the central to the northern Appalachians. Right. Thank you. And any other questions? I just have a quick question that's very selfish. Um, do those same asphalt beds occur all the way up in, say, New York, or are they different? Um, I believe, uh, what is it, Cell et al. did identify uh, some in the New York area or equivalent in the, in the New York uh, Appalachians up in the New York area. So, yeah, there are, they are as wide, that widespread. So, I mean, they extend from say the Appalachians all the way over to the upper Mississippi Valley and then up into, you know, probably the lower parts of the Northern Appalachians. Oh yeah. So unless anyone else has any last questions. Oh yeah. And Steve Leslie wanted me to let everybody know that his name is misspelled on the abstract. It's spelled right here, though. It's important to notice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Um, we can go ahead and get started with the next presentation then.
which will be another Richard, Richard Stocky with Ocean on an Ocean, Ocean Anoxia, and the onset of the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. Okay, can you see my screen and I'm not in presentation view? Now you are in the presentation. Great, okay, not in presenter view. Sorry, that's no. what I mean. Um, as you'll see, I also have an orange glow because of the California sky right now. Um, so I'm in a similar boat to Josh. Um, hi everyone, I'm Richard. I'm a grad student in Eric's Boeing's lab at Stanford. And today I'd like to talk about some geochemical and modeling work we've been use, doing to try and understand the relationship between ocean and oxia and the Gobi. Um, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and in particular Fei Fei Zhang, who's the co-first author on this study. Um, so to sort of orient you on what I'll be speaking about today, I'm mainly going to be presenting data and modeling um, of the sort of mid tremor ocean to mid Darrell Williams. So in terms of our understanding for the PBDB, sort of a lot of the lower diversity interval at the start of the Ordovician and then capturing some of the very start of the diversification that we see at the, the Pingy and Darrell Williams boundary. Um, and then just for additional context here, here's the record from the Fanatel science paper earlier this year looking at the GBDB database um, and showing that we're capturing a lot of this mainly planktonic diversification that they see in their record from mainland China. Um, so in terms of refining the environmental context of the Gobi, I'm going to be presenting four key steps today. The first is gathering primary geochemical data or generating primary geochemical data, which has mainly been um, performed by my collaborator Fei Fei. And then moving through to try and understand what that really means for Ordovician oceans. So looking at the uranium mass balance and modeling seafloor and oxia, and then going through to generate 3D ocean models of the Ordovician. Um, and then finally, trying to sort of take what we can learn from the uranium isotope record and reconciling that with what we know from other proxies about the Gobi um, and trying to create a mutually compatible time series of Earth system states through the Ordovician. So, First off, um, in terms of geochemical data, we've been focusing on uranium isotopes in this study. Um, so let's give a little bit of context for those. Um, in this schematic, I have a modern oxygenated ocean at the top and a poorly oxygenated ancient ocean at the bottom. I've illustrated oxygenated regions of the ocean in blue and euxinic or anoxic sulfide dominated regions of the ocean in red. Um, and the reason the uranium isotope proxy is so great um, is twofold. Firstly, as you'll see by the arrows that I've shown here, we have much greater uranium burial rates in anoxic portions of the ocean or euxenic portions of the ocean than we do in oxygenated portions of the ocean. Secondly, there's a big difference in the fractionation of uranium isotopes between euxenic and oxygenated settings. And what that means is that the extent of anoxic regions of the ocean can act as a really strong lever on the uranium isotopic composition of seawater. And the uranium isotopic composition, rather than just the concentration of uranium, are particularly useful because they're not subject to the same local um, burial rate effects and organic carbon loading effects that, that the concentrations are. So in our study, we've, we've sampled from multiple sites across La Rancha. We have sections from Svalbard, from Nevada, and from Utah. Um, and I'm gonna present that data in stratigraphic context first. I'm gonna go through that relatively quickly and I'm gonna present summary diagrams in a, minute, in a minute, but I just want to show what it looks like stratigraphically. As we look at this section from Svalbard with this box showing um, the uranium isotope values, as you can see, aside from this, this quite short negative uranium isotope excursion in the Tremid Ocean, we seem to have relatively consistent uranium isotope values between a sort of minus 0.6 and minus 0.3 per mil from the Tremor Ocean all the way through to the Darrow William. As we look at Nevada in the Michael John Peak and Shingle Pass sections, we see a similar story. Maybe some low values in the Tremor Ocean, but again, values between sort of minus 0.6 and minus 0.3 per mil throughout the section. Um, and finally, as we look to I the Ibex locality in Utah, again, a very similar story. No directional change as we move from the Tremor Ocean through to the Darrow William. Um, and if instead of looking at that um, in terms of stratigraphic height, we use stratigraphic age modeling and look at this in terms of order, the Ordovician timescale, um, again, aside from this 
short negative excursion in the Trevid Ocean, we seem to see relatively flat uranium isotope values throughout this interval of the early to mid Ordovician. Um, and before we delve into sort of the what that means in terms of modeling oceans, I think the really interesting thing that we're seeing in these trends is no directional change for the Ordovician. We don't see any big changes in our proxy for bottom water um, anoxia through this period of the Ordovician. Um, so how do we go from, from these geochemical data um, to modeling what that means in terms of, of ancient Ordovician oceans? Um, if we go back to the schematic that I showed before, as I said earlier, um, the high burial rates and big uranium isotope fractionations in euxinic settings mean that the extent of euxinia or the extent of anoxia with the presence of free hydrogen sulfide can act as a really big lever on the uranium isotopic composition of seawater. Um, and if we present that in a more mathematical sense, what we're really saying is that the changes in the uranium isotopic composition of seawater with respect to time are a function of this value f ux, the extent of euxinic seafloor. Um, and that's awesome because when we build into numerical models, um, things like burial rates, riverine inputs, and isotopic fractionations, we can begin to generate um, models of what uranium isotope values mean in terms of the extent of that anoxia. And all of this approach relies on this idea that shallow water carbonates predictably record the seawater chemistry. But as I showed before, we have three composite sections from across the world that are all showing pretty similar values. So I think that's pretty good evidence for that. Um, so this schematic seems great. Um, in our modeling approaches, we've been incorporating a few extra things um, to try and give a more realistic picture of how all division motions would really have behaved. Um, firstly, critically, as we observe from modern environments, trace metal burial rates are not the same in all euxinic settings and neither are the fractionations. Um, in addition, I've been showing euxinic settings because they're the kind of anoxic settings we predominantly observe in modern oceans. But we know that ferruginous anoxic environments, i.e. anoxic environments without the presence of free hydrogen sulfide, um, they're often expected to be iron rich, were much more common in the early or in the Ordovician and in the early Paleozoic more generally. Um, and we know much less about how they affect uranium burial rates and uranium isotope fractionations. Um, and finally, shallow water environments where we make observations about uranium in the modern are very different to deep water environments. So we've built pseudospatial models um, based on some models generated by Chris Reinhard a few years ago um, to try and do a better job of capturing what happens when you have a dominantly anoxic ocean in deep time. Um, so in our models, instead of the, the classical uranium isotope modeling framework, we say that the changes in uranium isotopic composition of seawater with respect to time are a function of this f ux value, the extent of euxinic seafloor, and also a number of other things. Um, and we use a Monte Carlo modeling approach to try and quantify our geologic knowledge as numerical uncertainty. Um, and we published um, uh, our first paper using this Monte Carlo mass balance modeling approach in Nature Communications earlier this year, looking at the hanantian rhodanian boundary. And this model included um, both molybdenum and uranium isotopes, but, but the modeling approaches are very similar. Um, and in this study, we were looking at shale rather than carbonates, but again, very similar idea. Um, and what we did here was we took these values that are tri classically treated as constants in um, trace metal isotope mass balance models. And then we found minimum and maximum observations from either oceanography or laboratory experiments. Um, in our Monte Carlo approach, we ran our individual mass balance model um, a thousand times for each of our scenarios of euxinia um, to try and create sort of probability maps of what a synthetic or what a predicted sedimentary value for a, a trace metal isotope in sediments would look like for a given extent of euxinic seafloor. This was the plot in our Nature Communications paper, but I'll focus instead on our, our plots for uranium and carbonates um, because that's more relevant to this work today. So here on the x-axis, we have this f ux value. So the, the proportion of the ocean that is covered in euxinic bottom waters. And on the y-axis, we have 
a predicted value for uranium isotopes and carbonates. Um, and if we now look at our order vision uranium isotope data, that stable uranium isotope data from the Tremadocian to the Darawillian, we can see that it clusters around this peak that we see at the high end with, with large predicted f -Hux values. And as you might expect, that results in a probability space for order vision extent of bottom water anoxia that sort of only begins to peak a sort of three to four percent of the global ocean, the global seafloor being euxinic. Um, and then our uncertainty carries on until very high values up to about 80% of the seafloor being euxinic. Um, and critically, that's an, at least an order of magnitude more euxinia than we observe in the modern. Um, so we have these stable uranium isotope trends, but what I want to move on to now is discussing how that might relate to other things we know about the Earth system across the Gobi. And to do that, I want to talk about 3D ocean models, specifically using um, the C. Genie Earth System model. And the C. Genie Earth System model um, was created by Andy Ridgewell, who's a professor at UC Riverside. Um, and it was designed for the biogeochemical um, characterization of paleoceanographic problems. Um, really awesomely for, for people here, we now have an order vision tectonic configuration or continental configuration C. Genie. It was developed by Alexandra Pohl and Andy Ridgewell. Um, and this enables us to model realistic, relatively high resolution or division ocean biogeochemistry. Um, and to look at an example of the kind of experiments we've been doing, we run each CGNIA system model for 10,000 years with a number of Earth system boundary conditions. Um, the most important of which are carbon dioxide. So here we're running at 16 times modern CO2, 40% modern atmospheric oxygen and 50% um, phosphate, ocean phosphate or productivity. Um, well, phosphate is how we parameterize productivity in Gini. And as you'll see, we get these relatively high resolution global maps, 3D global maps of the all division ocean. So we can predict for a given Earth system state what the dissolved oxygen concentration would be across the all division seafloor and also in all of the 3D um, ocean cells above it. And that allows us to calculate a predicted f -Ux value or a predicted extent of an oxic seafloor um, for a given a system parameterization, which is really cool. Um, so the, the final thing that I want to talk about is how we can reconcile these uh, systems models, not only with our uranium isotope data and what we've generated from our mass balance models, but also with the other things that we know about the Ordovician Earth system. So here I have um, the context figure from Stigalatal last year in P-cubed. Um, and as you can see, the range of our uranium isotope data overlaps with both at least the beginning of this, this predicted increase in atmospheric oxygen um, and also this gradual decline in oxygen isotopes. So this inference of global cooling through the Ordovician. Um, and in our work, we've been considering three key levers on the extent of anoxia. Um, here I'm using f anox rather than f -ux. You can consider the extent of anoxia and the extent of euxinia as pretty similar in the following plots I'm going to show, mainly because um, C. Gini doesn't have a great iron cycle just yet, but that doesn't dramatically affect our results. Um, so the three key levers that we see on this extent of anoxia, uh, oxygen, um, which intuitively, as oxygen increases, the extent of anoxia is going to go down. Um, temperature, which affects um, ocean oxygenation both through solubility effects and also through organic carbon loading. And then productivity, um, which through oxygen utilization, um, the more organic carbon loading you give the ocean system, the more anoxia you're likely to generate. Um, so to take a look at the uh, system experiments we've been doing, um, in this figure, again, we have f nox, which is equivalent to that f ux value that we have had from our uranium isotope models um, on the y-axis this time. And here's our predicted order vision ocean state based on our mass balance model. Um, I should emphasize that this is a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have atmospheric oxygen. Um, and then here, I'm showing points that are color-coded based on two temperatures, a sort of high hypothetical hot um, Ordovician Earth system state and a cooler Ordovician Earth system state. We have lots of intermediates, but I'm not going to show all of those today just because it will 
make things even more complicated. Um, and each one of these points represents a single 10,000 year Earth system model run, um, parameterized by three variables. So atmospheric CO2, atmospheric oxygen, and then some level of phosphate, which is basically how we drive productivity in this CG Earth system model. So for now, I'm just showing modern levels um, of ocean phosphate. And if we join up these uh, system models with lines, our cooler simulation and our hotter simulation, we'll see that if we simulate a hypothetical cooling event, what that does is serve to bring down the extent of anoxia from well within our probability space to much closer to the edge of our probability space for um, early mid order vision ocean anoxia. Um, if, we if we have a hypothetical oxygenation event, that has a very similar effect. Um, doing both in combination um, drives us pretty much out of our probability space, down off below um, the expected extent of anoxia based on uranium isotope values. Um, and that's just a case study, but as in the next plot, I'll introduce what happens as you change marine phosphate levels. This is a complicated plot, um, but here I've just cut, I've just added in four of those sets of simulations where I've color coded the phosphate levels based on the transparency of the line. What I really want to show here, um, as I'm running out of time, is that this demonstrates that we do have three key levers on the extent of ocean oxygenation and particularly deep water oxygenation um, in the order vision Earth system. So as we oxygenate our atmosphere, we bring down the extent of anoxia. Cooling has a very similar effect. So if, we, if the trends that we see from other proxies um, definitely took place through this interval of the order vision for which we're presenting uranium isotope data, we'd suggest that we need an increase, at least to some extent, in productivity, assuming that the cooling oxygenation is bringing us down off this probability space um, in order to counterbalance those other, those other reconstructions of order vision environmental change. Um, so just to recap, we present invariant uranium isotope trends um, between the mid-Tremid Ocean and the mid darawillian our error bound mass balance models suggest that three to 100% of global seafloor was covered in um, euxinic bottom waters through the early mid order vision. Um, and really, I want to sort of advocate for our system modeling as a way to uh, generate mutually compatible proxy reconstructions through the order vision and through other periods of Earth history. Um, and we're considering two M member scenarios, one in which our uranium isotope data is compatible with a relatively stable Earth system, and another in which an increase in nutrient supply and productivity is needed to balance out reconstructions of global cooling and or atmospheric oxygenation. And with that, I'd like to thank these people um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. It was an awesome presentation. And we do have time for questions, if anyone has them. Richard, I, I can ask a question. Um, I'm wondering how the uranium isotope redox record, uh, if it challenges anything from um, redox interpretations from uh, any other isotopic proxies like carbon isotopes, things that are maybe, um, I don't want to say less robust, but um, more ambiguous at least with interpreting them as a, as a um, redox signal? Right. Um, I think my, my answer would be that it, do, it doesn't have to. Um, I think one of the things that we've really noticed in our uranium isotope modeling is that the errors on the extent of anoxic seafloor that you're reconstructing with uranium isotopes can be pretty large. So um, there definitely are other things that are going to control carbon isotope trends other than the extent of anoxia. Um, but I'd also highlight that you could still be recording um, changes in the extent of say organic carbon burial through time within the windows that we're reconstructing with our models. So the sort of, the more high resolution trends we're seeing in carbon isotopes certainly aren't invalidated by flat uranium isotope trends. Okay, 
um, I think they can totally be mutually compatible. Cool, thank you. All right, thanks. All right, I'll stop sharing. Yes. I see someone else has a question. Oh, great. Uh, yes, I have a question, uh, which is basically when you mentioned uh, your data that you didn't, you put it into ages instead of the stratigraphy. And I wonder uh, why like uh, you're not considering the stratigraphy, particularly for the mid Darwinian, which is a lot of things happen during the mid Darwinian. And I think uh, the st stratigraphically speaking, it's very relevant when your data, your data stop uh, until which point m more specifically. Uh, where in the mid Darwinian you can see this uh, until when in the mid Darwinian you see this stability? Darwinian one or Darwinian two? Do you also the, uh, do you also cover the M dice? Um, so my understanding, my my work on the study has been predominantly on the modeling. So I will I will caveat slightly with that. Um, I'm not sure that we do capture the M dice here. I think. I, I think my honest answer would be it would be great to get more data through the Darrow Um I think I think that is hopefully an avenue for future work. Um, yeah, yeah, I I totally agree. There is there are many exciting things to investigate in the Darrow Okay, no, I'm just wondering like until what point in the in the Darrow do you think like you are like? Uh, I because would. I would need to check with Fei Fei. On okay. That one. Okay. Thank you. Good, thanks. And any other questions? Well, I have one. If there's time. Yeah. Oh, hi, Christine. Hi. I was just wondering because you uh, said that it was basically global data, or as I understand that uranium is a global proxy, as I understand, but, but your data is from the lower latitudes uh, in Dorentia. Does that in any way affect your model, or would it be global I don't, as such? I don't think so. Um, with these global proxies, there are always caveats to what we call global, and there certainly are, there are local factors that can govern uranium isotope signals. Um, I'm, I'm very reassured by the fact that we're seeing very similar trends between, between different sites and particularly with, with Svalbard being on the other margin of Laurentia relative to, to Ibex and, and Shingle Palace and Little John. Um, it would, it's, uranium isotopes are a very difficult measurement to make. It would always be awesome to have more data. Um, I'd love to see, I'd love to see data from a, yeah, you know, sort of a non low latitude site in this as well. Um, whether we'll get there or not, I'm not sure, but that's certainly something that will hopefully come with time. Thanks. Thanks, Kirsten. Okay, thank you again. And our next speaker is Eric Sperling with an exceptional record of early Paleozoic redox change from the Road River Group, Yukon, Canada. Great. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Um, I presume everyone can, can see this correctly. Yep. Great. Um, I picked up a bit of, a bit of smoke riding in through the California wildfires, but hopefully my, my voice will make it through this talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about a, a project we've been working on in the last five years in the Road River Group of Canada. I'd like to thank uh, all of these co-authors who've contributed to the project, as well as our funding sources, SPODs, NSF, Yukon Geological Survey, and the Sloan Foundation. Uh, and also thank the organizers for putting on such an awesome online um, set of talks. So following on from Rich's talk, which focused on the carbonate record, uh, I'm going to ask a somewhat similar question, which is, does the shale geochemical record support a more oxygenated global redox landscape through the main pulses of the Gobi? And there's about a million things I could talk about in, the, in terms of the Road River Group stratigraphy and geochemistry, but I'm going to try to focus as much as I can on, on this question. So those of you who know me will know that I haven't actually done that much focused work on uh, the Ordovician radiation or indeed the Ordovician. Most of my work 
has been focused on looking at neoproterozoic records of environmental change and kind of the ecological or ecophysiological effects on animals and whether this environmental change would have affected the course of, of animal evolution in the Cambrian radiation. So I've done a lot of my work uh, up here in places like the 15 mile group about 810 million years ago from the Ogilvy Mountains of Canada. And as we got much more interested uh, in some of these questions, it became clear that we have two different types of data sets between the Neoproterozoic and the Paleozoic or indeed Phanerozoic. So someplace like here in the Ogilvy Mountains, I've actually walked up kind of boneheadedly sampling shales every two or three meters. Plenty of other people have done the same exercise in many other places worldwide. And we actually have a pretty good uh, record of what I call the Neoproterozoic background state. In contrast, when we get into the Phanerozoic, the paleontological record is often telling us what intervals are interesting. And so we don't do studies of a whole stratigraphic group or formation. We zoom in to say just the one meter surrounding the Bonarelli horizon in Italy and study something like OA2. Now this gives us a lot of uh, insight into these events, but it also means we actually don't have that great a background record of Phanerozoic geochemistry. And so our goal is to do a shale, geochemic shale geochemical study at kind of the scope and extent at which we've been approaching the Neoproterozoic. And one of the best places to do this, if not the best, is in the Road River group in Yukon. Now during uh, the time period of interest, Northwest Canada is forming this little promontory on the Western Laurentian margin. And it had this fairly complex paleogeography with a series of uh, carbonate platforms and deep water shale troughs. And particularly we're looking in the Richardson trough at the Peel River section with the Ogilvy platform on the Yukon block to the west and the McKenzie platform to the east. If you're thinking about some sort of depositional model, you might think about the deep water basins uh, that, are, that are cutting through the Bahamas carbonate platform. So if something like the Straits of Florida or Tongue of the Ocean, or similarly the Delaware Midland basins uh, in the Permian Basin. The succession uh, is absolutely stunning. This is just a, a view from the helicopter. This is looking down on the tremid ocean part of the section. What's a, so amazing about the Red River Group is that you could start down here and just keep walking and walking and walking. And you'd be able to basically walk through about 110 million years of Earth history, all deep water sedimentation with very few stratigraphic breaks. If we get down on the actual rocks, this is what they look like. As I mentioned, all deep water sedimentation, mainly unbioturbated black shales, uh, necritic limestones and cherts. This is Justin Strauss down in the flowing part of the succession. And he's recently led a paper that we've published uh, that's now out early online in the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences that details the lithostratigraphy, biostratigraphy, sedimentology, uh, and carbonate, uh, carbon isotope chemostratigraphy of the section. There's a ton there if you're interested in carbon isotopes or um, Laurentian stratigraphic record, and I'd, I'd suggest you check it out. Uh, unfortunately, and heartbreakingly for Ordovician studies, two of the three uh, stratigraphic breaks in the section involve the Ordovician, and it looks like the Dipingian and Hernantian stages are both unfortunately missing at bedding plane unconformity. So this is Mike Melchin here and Justin, and kind of right in between them, it's a, a little hard to see, but it's a, a perfectly, appear, apparently perfectly conformable stratigraphic record uh, with the Hernantian stage missing in between them uh, and about a, a two centimeter break in section with no physical evidence for, for erosion. Um, so we'll start here looking at the, the stratigraphy. Um, this is the, the stratigraphic column from the Peel River section. Uh, the su succession actually continues down uh, for about uh, a kilometer through upper Cambrian and middle Cambrian strata down to the, the inception of the basin uh, during a middle Cambrian rifting event. I haven't shown that here for, for clarity purposes. Even so, it's, as you can tell, difficult to fit that much detail uh, into, into a, a kilometer and a half stratigraphic section. Um, the data we're going to talk about today, we start down here in the, the upper Cambrian, the Frongian, go through the, the lower, um, lower Ordovician, the Dipingian missing at this boundary here, the Darwellian, Sambian, Cadian, uh, Hernantian missing right there, and then into the Silurian. And if we were to keep going up and up and up, eventually we get all the way up into the middle uh, upper Devonian. The focus of this, of this talk is geochemistry, but of course we wanna start by looking at the, the sedimentology, ichnology, and paleontology of the succession. 
And what we found in measuring this whole section is consistent with what's been described by Northwest Canada re regional geologists for a long time, which is that it's basically unbioturbated. Uh, shown here in this column are the places where we do see bioturbation in the section. Um, there's actually a lot less bioturbation than it, than it appears. It's a kind of artifact of this kilometer and a half stratigraphic section. And most of these instances actually we interpret as, as really small breaths of oxygen into the basin that are important on ecological timescales and allow organisms to grab just a little foothold before it becomes anoxic again. And this is very similar to the pattern that Ty Stahl has beautifully um, documented from the, from the alum shale. The clear exception to this comes in the lower to mid Caudian. And if we look at these rocks, this are some, some really bioturbated cherts, big centimeter scale burrows, uh, very homogenized beds. And this occurs in a really uh, kind of thin interval between the, the uh, lower to mid Caudian decaudatus to lower decomplanatus zones. And if we go both above or below uh, this level, it's actually sandwiched by our, our classic Road River group, um, unbioturbated black shale. So these are from the, the upper decomplanatus and P Pacificus zones. So moving on from, from sedimentology and ichnology, the first uh, proxy that we applied to these, these, uh, this section is what we call the iron speciation proxy. Very briefly, iron is delivered to continental shelves as detrital iron oxides, and once there, it starts to become buried. And when, uh, after going down in the sediment column, it starts undergoing suboxic diagenesis, specifically iron reduction, and some of that iron too fluxes back out of the sediment. Most of it just reprecipitates out as uh, uh, iron oxyhydroxides, but some proportion of it is able to be transported out into the basin, although the, the details of how this happens um, are still a little unclear. Once you get out into the basin and uh, particularly to the chemocline, the point at which there's no oxygen left in the water column, that iron too can remain in solution and build up and eventually it'll precipitate out as orthogenic phases, either iron sulfides, pyrite, or iron carbonates or iron oxides. Although the details of, of which phases are precipitating out where as, as orthogenic minerals are still under debate. In any case, the end product of this shelf to basin iron transect is that we get, at least with respect to our, our detrital input, iron depletion on the shelf and iron enrichment in the anoxic basin. And so if we look at what we call the iron highly reactive to iron total ratio and the iron total to aluminum ratio, these are both gonna increase as we move from the oxygenated shelf into the anoxic basin. This highly reactive term, it's just a, an operational term that sedimentary geochemists use to describe the iron and carbonate plus the iron that's reactive to sulfide on early diagenic timescales. So iron and iron, uh, sorry, the iron and pyrite, plus these other phases, iron carbonates, iron oxides, and magnetite. This proxy has been empirically calibrated in the modern ocean. And what decades of iron geochemists have found is that samples in the modern ocean deposited beneath an oxygenated water column always have an iron, a highly reactive iron to total iron ratio of less than 0.38. So if we find a sample with a ratio higher than that, we're going to interpret it as it having been deposited under an anoxic water column. The proxy is also relatively unique in being able to distinguish between these two flavors of anoxia that Rich mentioned. So euxinic with hydrogen sulfide present and ferruginous with no hydrogen sulfide or free ferrous iron present. And people usually take a ratio of pyrite to highly reactive iron between about 0.7 or 0.8 to distinguish between these two states. So we start looking at our highly reactive to total ratios for this uh, data set. We see that they almost all fall in this anoxic field, which is basically what we'd expect based on the unbioturbated nature and the fact that there's no, um, there's no body fossils. Interestingly, in this highly intensely burrowed area, uh, we actually do the little thin shales that we see do actually still fall in the, uh, the anoxic region, which is a little strange, although I know there's actually a lot fewer samples in that little region um, uh, than we'd expect. So the take home from this iron speciation data is that anoxic bottom water conditions dominate throughout the 110 million year history of the Richardson Trough. And a corollary of this, of course, is that we see no local geochemical evidence for oxygen changes through the main pulses of the Gobi specifically between the Tremadoc and Floian and the Darwellian and Sambian. 
Now, this could actually still be consistent with hypotheses for increases in atmospheric oxygenation. We don't actually know what the water depth of the Richardson Trough Basin floor is, but it's probably somewhere around a kilometer or two in depth. So it's possible that you were having continual chemocline deepening be during the Darwellian of Sambian because this iron speciation proxy is only recording the conditions in the bottom of the basin. And that by the time we get to the, the lower and mid caudian, you reach full oxygenation to the basin floor. And that's what results in this period of intense uh, bioturbation at that time. And this timing would, would actually be consistent with the oxygen curve that was, was published in Cole Edwards' 2017 Nature Geoscience paper. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there's, this is just a, an explanation. And at face value, this provides no local, no local evidence for uh, oxygen changes through the main pulses of the Gobi. So we can next look at our pyrite to highly reactive uh, ratios. And we see that for most of the history of the Road River group, the Ordovician, Silurian, and Early Devonian, they're all plotting in the ferruginous field, so, um, suggesting non-sulfitic bottom waters. Uh, and for me, as someone that's mainly worked in the Neoproterozoic, this is actually quite comforting. It feels, feels like home. So if you were to go way down in the stratigraphic section, down to the, down to the Tonian and the 15 mile group in Yukon, you'd see dominantly uh, ferruginous conditions. And this is something that people have found worldwide during this time period. And I think we're learning from, from this and a lot of other lines of evidence that the Neoproterozoic and early Paleozoic are not really as different as commonly suggested. Uh, intriguingly, we see a, a sharp change towards a, a higher dominance of eucinic conditions in the Devonian and specifically the Progian. Uh, I don't have too much time to talk about this, but we did want to test this using a more global data set. So we compiled all of the data that's, that's available in the literature. And we looked at the proportion of eucinic sample, proportion of, of shale samples that are, are plotting as eucinic. And you see much lower values through the Ordovician, Silurian, and early Devonian and then rising up substantially as we go into the middle and late Devonian. Uh, I'm gonna throw a ton of data at you here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it very briefly and then, then move on to the global implications of this data in hopefully a, a more um, palatable fashion. Um, uh, here shown is total organic carbon contents, orthogenic molybdenum contents, orthogenic uranium contents, and uranium molybdenum, molybdenum uranium ratios. Um, just as, as kind of brief take-home messages from this, we see positive orthogenic molybdenum and uranium uh, uh, enrichments in basically all samples, which are consistent with anoxic conditions as suggested by the iron speciation record and the, and the sedimentology. And we see relatively low molybdenum uranium ratios, which would also be consistent with early Paleozoic ferruginous conditions. And then finally, we see major increases in molybdenum and uranium orthogenic uh, enrichments as we go into the early Devonian. Instead of talking more about this data, I'm gonna give a, a brief intro into how we interpret these records uh, as a window into global redox landscapes. So these figures will, will look pretty similar to riches. It's kind of the same idea, only using uh, mass balance of elements instead of isotopes. We have up on top a modern well oxygenated ocean and down here an ancient poorly oxygenated ocean. So in the modern, uh, most of the re dissolved redox sensitive elements are delivered by, via rivering flux. Uh, and once in the ocean, their most effective um, sinks into the, into the sediment or removal pathways are under reducing or, or eucinic conditions, depending on the trace metal. Now in the modern ocean, there's actually very few true anoxic or eucinic areas. So you could think of this as like a big bucket with something coming in and very few holes in it. So the level in there, our level of dissolved uh, metals actually builds up. Now, because the, the amount of orthogenic enrichment that you get in an anoxic setting will be directly related to the size of your dissolved metal reservoir, if you look in a well oxygenated ocean in any given anoxic area, you're gonna expect to see on average high sediment redox sensitive element concentrations. In contrast, if we look at an ancient poorly oxygenated ocean, same flux of elements um, uh, only in this case, we have our, our reducing sinks everywhere. It's like having a ton of, ton of holes in your bucket. You're going to end up with a really low dissolved metal reservoir. And if you look at any particular anoxic area, you're going to see low redox sensitive element concentrations. So these are all the data, both our data from the Road River Group and globally. Um, they're separated out by redox facies. So these 
plots on the top of orthogenic uranium and uranium TOC ratios are all samples with iron species or iron, iron geochemical data for anoxic conditions, whereas these molybdenum plots below uh, uh, are only samples with iron speciation evidence for euxinia. Uh, these are plotted as standard blocks plots in 10 million year bins with these little gray dots representing um, the reweighted bootstrapping method of Keller and Shaney, which should take into account spatial and temporal sampling heterogeneity. Um, and we're gonna interpret this in this, this canonical framework with higher levels representing an increasingly oxygenated global seafloor redox landscape. So if I were to kind of just draw some cartoon diagrams through these figures, uh, what we're gonna see is, is broadly consistent between the different proxies. So, if we look at orthogenic uranium concentrations, we're going to see higher levels in the upper Cambrian, uh, Tremidocean, and Floian going down in kind of the Darwellian Sambian, and then going way back up in the, the lower, um, lower and middle uh, Devonian. Orthogenic molybdenum, high levels uh, in the early Ordovician, crashing back down, a couple of wiggles, going back up again uh, in, the, in the, the middle to upper Devonian. Uranium TOC ratios. Um, Again, high, perhaps a slightly later decline and a, a more muted increase as we go into the, uh, the end of the Devonian. And finally, molybdenum TOC ratios, uh, high levels in the Tremadoc and Floian, crashing back down, again, some wiggles and going back up again, perhaps a little bit earlier than, than some of these other records. So some of these samples likely have to do um, with, with sampling, some likely have to do with the, the different uh, behaviors of these different elements, but clearly we're seeing evidence for a dynamic uh, early Paleozoic redox landscape. And in particular, all of these records are suggesting that we're pointing towards a more reducing global landscape as we move from the Tremidocean and Floian through the main pulses of the, of the Gobi. So in conclusion, uh, we see evidence for long-lived early Paleozoic deep water anoxia in the Richardson Trough and also evidence for a dynamic redox landscape through the early Paleozoic. And this does not appear to be a state change from the Neoproterozoic. So we're often told that kind of as we go through the Neoproterozoic oxygenation event, we enter this different world. And I think we're learning from a lot of different data sets that that's just not the case. And in particular, we see in the Road River group, there's about an 80 million year period that's characterized by the persistence of ferruginous conditions, both in the Road River group and globally, that looks very similar, at least in that respect, um, to, uh, to um, the Neoproterozoic. Both our local geochemical and our global shale redox proxies suggest there's no change or a change towards more reducing global redox landscapes through the Gobi. And I think this is a pretty strong signal that is coming out of the shale redox landscape. But as Rich, Rich talked about, there are different ways that we can interpret these such that they would be consistent with atmospheric oxygenation. So we talked about, with respect to the local proxies, how we might have had continual chemocline deepening in the Darwellian and Sambian with full oxygenation of the basin in the lower and mid Caudian. Likewise, Rich showed how atmospheric oxygenation is a big control on the seafloor redox landscape, but other factors, particularly temperature and primary productivity, are really important. And some of these could have been balancing out uh, an increase in atmospheric oxygen such that our global redox landscape changed the stayed the same. Now, when Rich and I argue about these things, I tend to fall a little more on the, on the side of the, the null hypothesis, although I'd argue that that isn't actually that well-founded. And I think, obviously, our key goal going forward is trying to reconcile these different uh, data sets that we see. And finally, uh, I just give a, a plug. Um, I think properly accounting for geological factors and sampling biases is really the next step be between moving beyond these first order plots. And uh, part of this uh, we've been trying to address through the Sedimentary Geochemistry and Paleoenvironments Project. If you are not aware of this project, please check it out at our website, especially if you have geochemistry data and you'd like to be uh, involved. Thank you very much. I apologize for going uh, a little bit over. Thank you, that was a great talk, but unfortunately we don't have time for questions. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question, feel free to put it in the chat or contact Eric. Um, our last speaker for the day is Gustavo Voldman with Conodonts from, from Silisticlastic Rocks, a case study from the Porto Ozello del Tonto Formation or Division of what the Western Argentine Precordilla 
and I believe this one is pre-recorded. Yes, hi. Yes. Hello, I hope you are okay. First of all, I would like to thank Alicia and Christian for the excellent organization of the meeting. In this presentation, I will show you some recent advances in the Conan study of the Argentina Precordillera, with the emphasis on a recently studied Conodon fauna collected from the Siliciclastic Portezuelo del Dontal Formation and discuss their biostratigraphic importance. The Argentina Precordillera is a fold and thrust belt that extends between 29 and 33 degrees south in the Andean foothills, extending for more than 400 kilometers mainly through the San Juan province, bounded by the Andes to the west and the Sierras Pampeanas to the east. The Precordillera plays a key role in a number of West of one and tectonic reconstructions for the early Paleozoic. Its thick Cambrian or Dovision Carbonate platform sequence is unique to South America and makes a part of a large region that is referred to as the Cusania Composite Terrain. Based on structural and stratigraphic criteria, three domains were distinguished in the Precordillera, namely the Eastern, Central, and Western domain. The Eastern and Central Precordillera represent an important Cambrian to Middle Ordovician Carbonate platform, which is covered by Siliciclastic Foreland deposit with occurrence to the West. The Western Precordillera exhibits deeper environments with a slope to ocean floors, sedimentary rocks that include pillow lavas and mafic ultramafic bodies in the western sections. During the Middle Ordovician, an important paleogeographical rearrangement of the post centers and source areas took place associated with the demise of the coronet platform. This critical interval is recorded diachronously in the basin through widespread deposition of black shales over the fossiliferous limestone of the San Juan Formation and local deposition of oligostrum, vibrate flows, conglomerates, and turbidites. The Eastern Precordillera is well known for its excellent Cambrian rock outcrops. It also includes glacial related deposits and iron rich levels in the Irnantian Don Braulian Formation, which are overlain by the Silurian Rinconada Melange. The melange is also visible in this image in contact with the San Juan formation to the background. Following Carrera and co-authors and Mestre, the Gianzi Placognato Casuzón is present at the top of the San Juan and the base of Los Azules formations in the Villicum range. Lower later the Vision Conodon were recorded in La Pola formation in the Villicum range by Heredia Milana, whereas later Rewillian conodons were obtained from Alonsono class at the base of La Cantina formation by Albanesian co authors. The oldest conodons from Central Precordillera were recorded in the lower levels of the La Silla formation at Cerro La Silla by Leonard and colleagues, who obtained a Clavohamulus hinsei phonon, indicative of the upper subform of the Furangian Cordylodus intermedium zone. Mango Alban and Albanese established a detailed biostonation from the middle treval dojan, Paltus del Tifel del Tifel South Zone, of the Paltus del Tifel Zone, at the top stratum of the La Silla Formation, up to the lower division in the upper exposed levels of the San Juan Formation. Other classic stratigraphic sections of the Central Picolidera with outcrops of the San Juan Formation are Pachaco, whose the faunas were originally studied by Sir Pagli, and the Nikibil section, proposed as GSSP for the Middle Ordovician and its auxiliary section of the Castle. The main Ordovician stratigraphic section from the Central Precordillera for Conodon are indicated in this map. The stratigraphic column from La Chica reflects the drowning of the open marine San Juan Carbonate platform towards graptolitic black shales in more restricted environments which occurred almost synchronously in the central extension section during the early middle of Rewillian and the Placognatus Crassusan. For example, a red conodon fauna indicative of the Yancy Placognatus Crassusan was recovered from the uppermost levels of the San Juan Formation and the lower levels of the Los Azules Formation at the Oculta Creek. Moving forward to the work, are the outcrop of the Los Sombreros formations, which represent 
the Western Continental Margin Slope Deposit of the Argentina Precordillera. The on the map indicate the main study localities. These are the outcrops of the Los Sombreros Formation at Los Tunneles and Puerto de Ancaucha. It's worth noting that the red sedimentary gravity flow deposit includes conodons with high key values preferable to the Tremadors and Paltitus their zone, whereas autotronous conodons recovered from the Darrywillian matrix and calcarenite in a field present a key three. The Los Sombrero Formation was also sampled for condoms at Aguada de la Cueva, El Salto, and Ojo de Agua Creek. This is characteristic of the Farangian, you should use the simple stack zone of the Cuyos Intermediate Zone and the Tremadogian Massachusetts Leonid Zone were obtained from Brescia, Mastus, and Cassiturbidites. The West of Hatchel. The Los Sombrero Formation is covered by the Darry Williams to early Zambian Terbaloca Formation. The Terbaloca Formation is characterized by sandstone, paston, and sparse conglomerates, and concordant to subconcordant mafic and dramatic bodies. The conodon fauna proceeds from carbonate plastic turbidite samples, calcarenites, which are much more frequent in the eastern sections. The Terbaloca Formation correlates to the south with the Sierra del Invernada Formation. This unit is similar to the Terbaloca formation, although it resembles more siliciclastic shelf environments than deep marine turbidites. It crops out, it crops out for circa 60 kilometers along north-south Sierra del Invernada, varying between 1,000 and 4,000 meters in stratigraphic thickness, probably involving tectonic repetition. The siliciclastic succession is relatively well known by its conodon and graphite content ranging in age from the Reguilian up to Katian. The Sierra del Invernada formation is dominantly siliciclastic, yet includes frequent calcarenite levels interbedded between conodons and more rarely graptolites. Continuing to the south from Sierra del Invernada, the Portezuela del Tontal formation comprises the siliciclastic deposit with turbidity features that crop out in most of the Sierra del Tontal the highest range of the Recordillera. It is exposed for approximately 100 kilometers with north-south direction and with an average each way extent of 10 kilometers. From the San Juan River, extending far beyond into the Sierra del Tigre, to the north, the boundary between San Juan and Mendoza provinces to the south. According to Henrik and colleagues, its sedimentation occurred in a distal shelf setting influenced by storm waves. Although presenting a large aerial distribution and an estimated thickness of two kilometers, the Puerto Suelo del Tantal Formation is generally buried of species, apart from locally abundant Crociana, limestone class with fauna suggestive of the San Juan Formation as a source area, and more importantly, middle lapper or Dovisian graptolites in sandstone bedding plane surfaces. In an attempt to precise the age of the position of the Portezuelo del Tontal Formation, we thoroughly searched for rocks with a carious acidic reaction in the Telegrapho Creek and the Cerro Condores Extractigraphic section on the western and eastern lobes of the Sierra del Tontal, respectively. All exploratory samples from the Telegrapho type section resulted varied from coronados, with sandstone beds that showed lightly calcareous acidic reactions in the field but not in the laboratory. In Cerro Condores, the Portezuelo del Tontal Formation presents centimeter to decimeter tabular sandstone spikes that alternate with a few lenticular sandstone bed with a slight calculus acid reaction, grading into marston and dark gray shales. Rock samples weighing 2-3 kilograms each were crushed and processed in formic and buffer acetic acid following the standard conodon laboratory techniques. From a total of 10 samples, only two were productive, yielding 60 conodon elements. The recovered assemblage includes Ancela Finlandica, Costiconos Costatus, Paristodo Horridus Horridus, Paristodo Horridus Secundus, Peraiodo Macrodentatus, Protopanderodus Graei, and Espinodus Spinatus, which typically coexist in the Darry William, Middle Ordovician, and Cepla Cognatus Crassus 
the record of Paracordylodus gracilis, Epicodus species, and Protoprionellus species, apart, apart and mixed character for the fauna, as they were probably derived from middle lapper flowing strata. Ortiz and co author of certain analogous reworking process in the shelf deposit of the Sierra de la Invernada formation to the north, where the Rewillian sediment, host limestone class of the Picudus Ibis zone, was slightly sourced from the San Juan formation to the east. The Jens Placoniatus Picudus zone has wide geographical distribution in the Precordillera, involving most of the transitional interval from the San Juan formation to the overlying Hualcamayo, Los Azules, Las Chiquitas. Las Aguaditas formation at the eastern and central domains of the Recordillera. Therefore, the lower siliciclastic shelf deposition of the Portuguese formation at Sierra del Tantal can be precisely correlated with the change of regimen in sedimentation associated with the drowning of the Precordilleran carbonate platform, beginning as early as in early Darwinian times. The recovery of middle upper flow and reward conodons elements in the Portezuelo Central Formation also suggests active recycling of the current platform to this, possibly reflecting the Darwinian reconfiguration of the Precordilleran Basin. The record of Yance Placoniatus Cusón in the Portezuelo Central Formation allows for a tight intercontinental correlation with South China and Baltiscandia, improving the knowledge on the dynamics of the Precordillan basin and the paleogeographic distribution of its fauna. By sharing our results from the Precordillera, we hope to promote more constant investigation in the Ordovician siliciclastic sedimentary deposit, as they will help to complete the Ordovician fossil record. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, great. And I believe uh, Gustavo is here. Yes. So if there are any questions. I'm, I'm sorry for the quality of the audio. That's fine. I, I think we could all hear. And you had subtitles on. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So, and uh, is the young Plagonatus crassus zone? Um, do you have any idea as to uh, how long it is as compared to what we see on Baltica, for instance? Is it a longer zone, or is it the same, or what do you think? I I don't have a, a clear response for that. Okay. I was just wondering because it's a very short zone uh, here, and it seems like a, a, a at least a thick one in in the, in the pre cordillera So it was just interesting. And any other questions? Okay, well, so that is the last presentation for today. So I just would like to thank all of the presenters for, who were in this session, as well as the organizers for everything they've done to set this up. And just a reminder that the recording will be available on the YouTube channel if you want to rewatch it or anything. Um, so see you all tomorrow. And I can just say that we will create some breakout sessions again if people want to hang out afterwards, uh, have a beer or a morning coffee or wherever you are. And yeah, and otherwise, I'll just see you all tomorrow. Bye.